I'm very pleased to have the opportunity to present you today with a synthesis of our recent and collaborative works at CC, and in particular for this talk today, with information about its occupation in the advanced late Bronze Age. Uh, I would like to thank Yanis Galanakis and the or organizing committee for inviting me to present a part of our excavation project. And also thank you to Andrew for this kind of introduction. Most of you don't normally need an extensive introduction to where and what CC is. And Quentin Le Tesson even presented a seminar here last year uh, about the pre palatial settlement at CC. But let me briefly set the scene again. Since 2007, the Aegis Research Group of the University of Louvain, under the auspices of the Belgian School at Athens and the direction of Jan Driessen, has been exploring this coastal mining site located about four kilometers east of the palace town at Malia. Two series of five-year campaigns and now a third series have brought to light extensive remains spanning the entirety of the Bronze Age from circa 2600 to 1200 BCE. They include funerary area, domestic and artisanal quarters, and two large public compounds, among which a large complex, building CDE, located on the summit of the hill and dating to the 13th century BCE, i.e. to the late minor and 3B phase, which is the subject of my talk today. This building has been excavated in different zones under the direction of uh, Florence guignot dressen Quentin Le Tesson, and Maud de Volder, with the help of several teams of workmen and international students. This lecture is then obviously based on a collective effort and in particular on the extensive data produced by these three scholars and colleagues and their teams. The size and internal organization of this multi-room building, as well as the diversity of the materials recovered from it, are rather unique, illustrating a large range of domestic, artisanal and cultic activities. Evidence for social gatherings is also abandoned. Since 2013, several campaigns of conservation, documentation and analysis of the many assemblages retrieved from this complex, especially pottery, have taken place. And it's now possible to present an overview of the chronological development and variety of local practices illustrated by the material culture used by the occupants of the building. This also invites us to investigate the specific nature and context of some artifacts that hint at the composite origins of the CC communities at the end of the 13th century. Overall, through a contextual study of a comprehensive body of artifacts, we aim to shed new light on the different practices and networks of relevance of the post-palatial communities of Crete during this critical period of the advanced late Bronze Age in the Aegean and Eastern Mediterranean. Today, I will focus on a presentation of the pottery assemblages of building CDE, and this will allow me to stress important chronological markers that refine our understanding of the site's history, but with, it will also reveal the diversity of the activities held in this complex. In the last part of my talk, I would like to contextualize some of these assemblages and practices at an extra local scale in order to highlight some of, some of the various interaction networks in which the inhabitants of building CDE took part. We have identified two distinct chronological horizons within the century-long LM3B phase of occupation of this building. In essence, several blocked internal doorways have urged us to consider a horizontal stratigraphy with the distinction between rooms occupied in an earlier phase uh, and then abandoned and blocked after a major destruction, and on the other hand, rooms cleared of their debris after this, this, this destruction and reoccupied in a later phase. The complex comprises a large north wing building CD 
and a smaller second wing, building E, located to the south of an open area. The north wing is structured into two main zones, each organized around a large pillar room and separated by a corridor. The first occupation horizon is thus documented by primary destruction deposits found in the blocked rooms, which were not reoccupied after the destruction that struck the site in the, uh, at the middle stage of LM3B, probably related to an earthquake. The second horizon started with the reconstruction and reoccupation of a large part of the north wing, while the occupation of the south wing ended at the end of the first phase. The second occupation phase lasted until the very end of LM3B, when the building and the entire site are deserted. With regard to the first occupation horizon, this concerned primary destruction deposits found in the rooms highlighted here in blue. In particular, room 4.9, a small space measuring 2.4 by 2 meters, was found full of ceramic material. It provided storage vessels with two petal, two transport stirrup jar, a fragmentary open jar and a lid, and also cooking ware with two large tripods cooking pots and two braziers. Fine ware was also associated with the same deposit, including this exquisite jacket and another one just next to it. Conical cups, footed cups, a shallow cup, probably fallen from a shelf along the, the, the wall, and a complete uh, firebox and two-footed conical bowls complete the deposit. This small room communicated with room 4.8 to the east and with the large hall 3.1 to the south. So we can hypothesize that room 4.9 functioned as a storeroom for providing tableware to activities held in the large hall, but also possibly food containers and cooking sets for the preparation of meals in room 4.8 where evidence for a hearth and a grinding installation has been found, associated with charred plant remains and a high concentration of seafood remains. To the other side of the north wing, we can point out another kitchen, contemporary to this first phase, its room 4.15. It opens only on the court and on the south wing of the complex, which suggests a clear connection between the two wings. The floor deposit in this space is quietly, quite intriguing. Cooking activities are clearly indicated by an overfired ceramic plate resting on the floor, just next to a pithos half embedded into the floor and found full of urchin remains. Cooking pottery is evidence in the room, but is very fragmentary. Interestingly, just next to the cooking plate was this finest vessel, an imported canyon stirrup jar, but also a deep bowl, a set of miniature vessels, and this cylindrical model. The later reminds us of two examples from LM3B Amnesis and several examples from LM3C Carfi. This kind of object with exclusive occurrence in residential context has been in interpreted in a framework of household cultic activities with a possible connection with ancestors in particular, as suggested by Vasilis Petrakis. Also surprising in this room 415 are the nine half preserved pithoi and jar found smashed on the floor of this room, but which are systematically missing the lower part. Therefore, the material and the functional association of these various kinds of ceramic containers for cooking, drinking, worshipping and storing in a room of six square meters is not straightforward. The excavation data tend to suggest that it is a single primary deposit. However, the fact that most of the large containers lack their lower part and base suggests that they no, do not belong to the primary floor deposit of this room. It's not impossible that some of these pithoi fell from an upper story, upside down, and were partially disturbed after deposition by modern plowing activity, for example, which would explain their incompleteness and dislocation. In the south wing, 
three rooms provided primary destruction deposit related to the same first archaeological horizon. Here, a localized fire accompanied the suggested seismic destruction. Of particular interest is an important drinking set found within those rooms, with footed cup, a diver bowl, deep cups, and this jug with a tuberous spout. Two large and a small globular jars, as well as, as well as a tripod cooking pot, complete the deposit. Other less common vessels were also found in one of these three rooms, such as a bathtub uh, larnax, a snake tube, and this poppy writer. The nature and distribution of the finds in the destruction layer suggests that the existence of an upper floor where these three objects once possibly stood. A cultic, fun cultic function can be proposed, which contrasts with the plain cubs, jacks, and jar and tripod cooking pot found on the ground floor, sometimes squashed by the collapse of the larnax. Finally, a large pit, pit 87, uncovered in the open area, is possibly related to an episode just posterior to the seismic event. It was found full of lithic tools, but also of a large assemblage of fine open vessels linked to drinking and eating, and coursewares associated with food preparation. The combination of the stratigraphic, ceramic, and groundstone data suggests that this pit may precisely be connected with the rebuilding episode of the North Wing of Building CDE, as suggested by the date of the material linked to a middle stage of LM3B, but also the state of preservation of the pottery and the little lictic tools. Indeed, some vessels show very little use wear, and the use marks on the pebbles indicate their use in building activities, but for a limited period of time. Complete vases are nevertheless rare in this uh, pit 87. Out of the 161 catalogued vessels, 21 are preserved at a minimum of 50%, but 119 are less than 20% preserved. This indicates at least two different possible scenarios. If the pit contents were the result of a cleaning activity after an LM3B destruction, this would suggest that the operation was only partially carried out in this pit and that the rest of the material was left in situ and or discarded elsewhere, a possibility that it's not corroborated by the present state of the remains of building CD and its surrounds. If, however, this pit was the repository of feasting or communal drinking and dining activities, probably held in the open court, the rest of the broken vessels could either have been thrown into another area as yet unexcavated or kept by the participants and taken away as tokens or something else. The quantification of the fine open vessels gives a good idea of the variety of the assemblage, and it also provides an account of the local consumption of finewares at LM3BCC, which convincingly indicates a mid-stage of LM3B. The repertoire includes both fine planewares, often slipped and burnished for the footed caps, high stem kilikis, or jiver bowl and shallow bowl here on the top right, but also fine dark and light painted wares for deep bowls, deep cups, mugs, and a shallow cup. The more unusual combination of shape, decoration, and fabric of these three vessels, a deep bowl, a shallow, a shallow cup, and a mug, suggests imports, possibly from the Mycenaean mainland, and comparisons with finds from Attica in particular can be suggested. Moving now to the later LM3B occupation horizon of the North Wing, after the earthquake destruction, it seems reasonable to reconstruct a last occupation phase which covered close to two generations and which ended in the general abandonment of the site at the very end of LM3B. The primary floor deposits found in the two large holes and several side rooms show important and repeated evidence for cooking activities, but also communal consumption practices, some artisanal production, storage in pithoi, and cultic activities, as we will see. 
The pottery from this LM3B advanced deposits includes totally new shapes at the site. Among them are objects for which the best parallels point to a very late stage of LM3B, as we will see, that is in the last decades of the 13th century. These new features in the LM3B late pottery assemblages at Sisi concern imported vessels, such as this footed crater, but also more locally produced vessels that mix local features with Mycenaean or Mycenaean trays, such as this bell-shaped crater. However, for the first time in Bronze Age Crete, morphological changes in line with mainland traditions do not only concern table habits, but also the cooking repertoire. The first hall, 3.1, is a large space that could host 30 to 40 people. In this last stage of building CD, it only communicates with the exterior to the east via a large threshold and with kitchen 4.7 to the west. Since the three other original accesses to this main room were blocked at the beginning of the second phase, as you can see here in red. Two large domed ceramic items were smashed in the middle of the room, close to the column bases. Then they may have been used as chimneys to evacuate the smoke for a potential fireplace between the two columns. However, no traces of ash which could suggest the presence of such a horse were identified between the two column bases. The use of, uh, of a ceramic portable horse could explain the absence of ash from the clay surface. A portable horse of this type with a diameter of uh, 38 centimeters was found in a neighboring room. The floor deposit of room, of room 3.1 is concentrated towards the east threshold and shows evidence for storage and artisanal activities. First, in the southeast corner of the room was a complete pitos, heavily broken on the floor. Just north of the threshold, against the east wall, was an installation which could be an olive or wine press. On a platform, a tripod cooking pot, reused without its legs, is embedded into the installation, and in front of it, smashed on the floor, were these two basins that you can see on the uh, bottom right. And further away, just in front of the threshold, were the fragments of a heavily broken but complete larnax decorated with octopus motifs, as you can see here on the top left. Smashed under the base of the larnax was a monochrome deep bowl, and the same deposit also contained a pierced endless goblet, which, with the deep bowl, constitute the only fine, fine tableware found in this large hall. Outside the room, in front of the facade, were collected this fine decorated stirrup jar and a transport stirrup jar. We might then suppose that the last use of this large room was mainly oriented to artisanal activities. However, while there is little direct evidence for food consumption in the room itself, the material found in the neighboring room 4.7 invites us to consider such activity in the large hall, as we will see in a minute. Before leaving all 3.1, it's interesting to note that in the middle of the room, at the same level as the upper surface of the two column bases, appear the fragments from the body part of a huge pitos with relief medallions and wavy incised bands. Another fragment of the same pitos was found under the blocking of the door leading to room 4.8. And other fragments of again the same pitos also came from the contents of pits 87 in the open area, which I just mentioned earlier, and also from the corridor between room 3.3 and 3.4. So this pit certainly belongs to an earlier horizon of building city and is even possibly neopalatial. Some fragments of this huge, possibly emblematic pit were perhaps intentionally used during the rebuilding of building CD, kept here in the hall 3.1 while the floor was relayed, used in the blocking of a door, and in the filling of the pit following the communal event that we suggest to link to the rebuilding episode. 
Directly west of uh, hole 3.1 is room 4.7, with two pillar bases and a, centra a central house. It provided a very important deposit with various evidence for cooking activities. The space seems to have functioned with hole 3.1, thanks to an opening in its east wall. The deposit includes a pito smash in the north part of the room, here on your left, and a concentration of vessels around and to the south of the hearth, made of, uh, the hearth which is made of a platform of stones and which was found full of ashes. Four tripod cooking pots were found, two with a globular shape and either vertical or horizontal handles, and two others that are much more atypical, one with a baggy profile and light on dark painted decoration, and the other with a shallow shape and a rounded bottom a shape with absolutely no precedent in Sisi or elsewhere in Crete. A cooking lid, two cooking trays, two cylindrical supports, and a cooking jug here on the right complete the cooking assemblage. Close to them were also found part of a round mouthed amphora, two medium-sized steel jars, a monochrome deep bowl, a juglet, and these three small steel jars one in the middle with a clumsy painted decoration of an octopus and a palm tree, and another on the right, which is probably a late Eladic 3B2 mainland import. And here are some good comparisons for this uh, stir jar, notably one from Torricos with also lozenges on the belly. Going now to the south part of building CD, in the second hole 4.11, we can see that it was entered from the south through a possible porch. And this large space also contained evidence for cooking around a central hearth, as well as for communal drinking consumption, as suggested by this uh, footed creature, but no drinking vessel in this uh, room. Four medium and small size finely decorated stirrup jar were also found all around in this big hall 4.11. The crater deserves some attention. It's not dissimilar to the late Melon 3B2 crater in Kenya, for example, where the most common types of craters also have a splaying or iron food. Those have no parallels with the contemporary craters from the Mighty mainland, except in late Eladic 3C early, with the introduction of the very rare crater FS10 with vertical handles though. At lm 3 c Carfi as well, all the craters that preserve their lower part show a pedestal base. The large hole 4.11 communicated with a corridor to the north, which opened to four different spaces, two multifunctional internal rooms, 3.3 and 3.6, a space with a large hearth and a few storage vessels, 3.4, and a domestic shrine found with its, cult, with its cult objects, among which a triton shell and an anther time, but also ceramic cylindrical support and conical bowls, as well as several transport stirrup jars and other large containers. I will describe room 3.3 and 3.6 here, both of which appear to have functions, functioned as storage rooms and working spaces. Room 3.3, was devoted to the storage of goods in coarse plain containers, as well as of different kinds of fine and air coarse ceramic vessels. The presence of various lithic tools distributed across the room suggests that it also served as a working area. The fine decorated vessels stored in the same room 3.3 confirmed the advanced stage of LM3B. Panel pattern decorated craters adorned with similar motifs have been found, for example, at, for example, at LM3C early Castelli Pediada, but also at LM3B late Palegastrocas 3. To my knowledge, the large shallow bowl with a rim diameter of 32 centimeters is a unicorn. The wide bending decoration is not dissimilar to the decorative syntax typical of bended cups at LM3, LM3B2 Kenya. However, a close parallel for this sizable shallow open vessel is hard to find, with the exception of a couple of late Eladic 3C early basins 
from left candy. In room 3.6, two tripod cooking pods of very large dimensions were found in the middle of the room, broken into large pieces. At the entrance of the room stood two pithoi along the wall of the corridor, and a particularly large quantity of pumice stones was found scattered around, possibly originally stored inside these pithoi prior to their use, perhaps as abrasive elements in various artisanal activities. The fabric, these are the pumice. The fabric, morphological traits, technical features, and dimensions of the two tripod cooking pots are identical. They are characterized by deep slashes made on the upper part of their legs. The two cooking pots show clear traces of hues on their outer surface with long drips left by some substances formed when the contents spilled over the rim during the cooking process. In addition to the two cooking vessels was found a spotted circular vat, the specific function of which required further analysis. These large vessels were found next to finer shapes in the same room, a small decorated stir jar, a straight-sided pixies, a trefer-mounted narrow neck jug, a footed cup, an adjival bowl, and a small jar. The stir jar is probably an import. It's made of a matte light brown fabric with regular bending decoration in red to dark brown paint on the body. These technical and stylistic, stylistic traits are not typical of the Mycenaean Milan, except in Achaia, in late Atlantic 3b or late Atlantic 3c early, while a few good parallels also come from late Atlantic 3c early left candy. It's worth mentioning that the question of a probable overlap between the late Eladic 3C early phase on the mainland and the late minor and 3B late phase on Crete has been around for a long time, but was recently considered in more detail by Jeremy Rutter. In the same room 3.6, a large collection of terracotta spools was found in two nests just under the large fragments of the tripod cooking pots. Their position right below the body fragments of the tripod cooking pots require some explanation. The spools were possibly stored within the tripod cooking pots, which serve as containers, possibly also of other objects or items in organic material, like textiles. However, the good state of preservation of the tripod cooking pots would seem to suggest that they were still in use as cooking vessels when the building was abandoned. In the framework of our comprehensive study of the cooking assemblages of Sisi, including organic residue analysis, Janet Safo reports the presence of beeswax in one of these two tripod cooking pots. This substance may result from a recipe cooked in the pot and using honey, but may also have been used as a sealant on the interior surface of the vessel in order to reduce its porosity. Or also for artisanal practices, such as the preparation of ointments, or else the waterproofing of textiles. Room 3.6 was therefore devoted to different kinds of domestic activities, including weaving, the storing and use of pumice stones as artisanal tools, but also of some more precious substances or liquids in the small syrup jar and pixies, and also cooking. Or else, in this specific case, the two huge tripod cooking pots may have been used in some artisanal activities, which required the heating of certain substances. We have come to the end of our tour of one century of occupation on top of the hill of Sisi from a ceramic perspective. To sum up, for the first half of the 13th century, we can reconstruct a large building with two wings on both sides of an open area. In the south wing, we have evidence for food preparation and consumption and cultic activities, somehow in connection with the occupants of the north wing, since the cooking activities that took place in kitchen 4.15 open um, seem to have been essentially devoted to gatherings held in the court to which the kitchen opened directly. In the north wing, primary data related to this phase are limited. 
based on the architecture, we can hypothesize about communal activities in the two large halls, which were connected by indirect circulation through internal spaces. Primary data from rooms 3.8 and 3.9 have nevertheless provided good evidence for food storage, preparation, and consumption during this phase, in all likelihood directly connected to the large hall 3.1. We assume, assume that a significant destruction took place in the middle stage of LM3B, probably caused by an earthquake, and it was followed by extensive reconstruction, which largely eliminated the debris and levels of the previous phase. We have good reason to suggest that the contents of the pit dug in the open area are the result of a short-term event, that is, the processing and then discarding of materials related to architectural work in building CD, and then the celebration of this rebuilding. Finally, during the second phase, which spanned a few decades at the end of the 13th century, communal gatherings probably continued in building CD, as indicated by the two craters, for example. Particularly striking is the numerous evidence for cooking and also artisanal activities not to mention the shrine nestled in the middle of the building. Sisi was thus a vivid settlement during an M3B and until the very end of the phase, when it was finally abandoned. I propose now to have a look at the more specific nature, context, and significance of some of these artifacts and assemblages in order to highlight the various networks of relevance in which the inhabitants of building CDE participated as evidenced by the material culture they used. At the micro-regional level, I have highlighted elsewhere the numerous similarities in terms of typology, styles, and technical features between the late Mayan 3B tableware from Sisi and Maya, as evidenced by Cartier Nu in particular. This suggests strong interactions and the sharing of traditions between both potters and consumers of these two sites. Beyond tableware, two other potting traditions shared by Sisi and Malia deserve a mention. The first one includes a group of coarse vessels of different types and shape, but all sharing a particular technistylistic tradition characterized by a light on dark surface treatment. The atmosphere of the firing seems to have been well controlled as the contrast effect between the light yellow paint and dark gray background is successful. These vessels are made in the typical local coarse fabric characterized by an all calcareous red brown firing clay matrix. However, Despina Arcibaliano has pointed out that this light on dark, dark, light on dark wear has some parallels in the late Mainan 3B Cato Guves pottery workshop, so the regional extent of this potting tradition requires more attention. The second putting tradition concerns coarse vessels of different types and shapes that share a common coarse pinkish buff fabric and are either plain or dark on light decorated. Vessels from this group here on the slide have all been analyzed petrographically by Karl Mappet, Florence Liard, and or Eleni Nodaro, who have all shown that their mineralogical composition is compatible with the Ophiel Ophiolite series and the Flisch Melange. These colleagues have discussed the difficulty of assigning provenance to this suite, since it is encountered over a long geographical distance from the area of Myrtos on the southeast coast, across the whole area of the Pediada, to the north coast of the island. Florence Liard has nevertheless demonstrated, through the sampling of raw materials, that there are that there are clay rich sediments containing ophiolitic rocks in the area of Hersonissos, about 12 kilometers west of Maria. She has therefore suggested that at least a part of this Corian fabric group, identified at Malia and Cartinu and now at Sisi, correspond to the exploitation of raw materials in the area of Hersonissos. Since particularly large objects are concerned, such as amphorite craters, Pitoy and this unique house model of Cartier Nu, it's reasonable to suppose the existence of a workshop or group of workshops in the vicinity of Hersonissos, or more broadly, 
in a triangle between the pottery workshop at Catogoves, the north part of the Pediada, and the area of Sicilian Maya. This is, of course, a work in progress. But it's worth noting that this potting tradition, especially concerned, transports stirrup jars and round mounted amphoras with dark and light decoration. And the decoration at the shoulder of these two star transport stirrup jars, one from Maya, one from Sisi, is particularly similar to two examples from the late minor and 3B levels in the Palace of Consuls, chemically identified by Halaskal and colleagues as products of central creed. Petrographic data are not available for these two Knotion stirrup jars, but in their comprehensive study of transport stirrup jars of the Bronze Age Aegean and East Mediterranean, Halaskal, Peter Day, and colleagues have also identified a very distinctive fabric group whose aplastic inclusions derive from the Ophiolite series in Crete. They note the important consistency of composition of these transport stereo jars, especially when one considers the wide array of their fine spots. Several come from Maya, but also from Knossos, Thebes on the mainland, and Komi in Cyprus, and the Uluburan shipwreck. Halaskels and colleagues also made clear that the so-called central Cretan group of transport stereo jars actually mask a larger reality with different north and south central production centers that still need to be properly identified. A larger program of petrographic and chemical analysis of transport stereo jars from an array of LM3B sites will certainly improve our understanding of the different, although probably limited, socioeconomic center which were active in LM3B Crete, especially in regions that have yet to reveal all their secrets, like the Pediada, but also the Mesara. So next to the two main production center of transport steroid jar in the Kanya area and in the Western Mesara, other key centers of production and distribution of bulk containers appear to have existed, like possibly here in Northeast Crete they may have functioned at other and smaller geographical scales. This invites us to investigate the interactions of the inhabitants of Sisi with a larger regional perimeter in the direction of the Pediada region on the one hand and the La City Plateau on the other. The survey, an amazing compilation of data related to the LM3B occupation of the Pediada region, has brought to light the existence of numerous and important LM3B settlements. These were connected to the North Coast through the Carteros Valley and the Aposelemis Gorge. The later connected the sites of the La City Plateau with the Pediada, also sheltering the remote site of Kalamavka, for example, before it opened onto the coastal site of Katogouves, where a pottery workshop was active in LM3B. The possible connection of Sisi, Malia, and sites from the Bediada around common clay sources and also possibly common economic activity, as I have just discussed, invites us to assess some potential common pottery traditions at the regional level. Looking at the Tabaray repertoire, these sites seem to have been rather well connected. The same assemblage of high stem kilikis footed cups, shallow bowls, ogival bowls, plain jugs with a cylindrical open spout, and amphorate craters, all in a buff to pinkish buff fabric, are found in Kalama at Kalamavka, Voni, Malia, and Sisi, for example. The, Kiliki, the Kilikis show on several occasions a solid stem on all these sides, just like those of the Gouves workshop. So a further assessment of the interactions during an M3B between these coastal sites and important settlements in the interland, close to the fertile land and communication networks, may help us to better grasp the political and economic organization of North East Crete during this key period. Turning now to the La City Plateau, the numerous LM3C defensible sites of the La City identified and studied by Krzysztof Nowicki and also Sarah Wallace, are only one possible area 
towards which the communities of Sisi may have moved after the abandonment of the site in the context of an imminent threat and or looking for other living conditions or an opportunity. A possible candidate is the site of Garfi, the foundation of which was led at the very end of LM3B. The question obviously deserves more attention, but particular ceramic vessels, as well as common clay recipes, link the assemblages of the two sites in an interesting way. Interactions between Sisi and other regions of Crete, the Mycenaean mainland, or the Aegean are indicated by several imports of small, finely decorated containers and a few open vessels. Preliminary, preliminary observation even suggests connection with various regions, but in the form of a limited number of vessels for each. The nature of these exchanges or interactions is therefore difficult to approach and evaluate, and this would, of course, require a full program of microscopic analysis. These fine containers, however, bear witness to the fact that these communities had fairly wide access, although possibly randomly, to a prestigious Asian economy built around precious, probably perfumed liquids. Finally, Major transformation of the ceramic traditions appear to characterize the second occupation phase at Sisi in the last decades of the 13th century. This concerned the introduction among the tableware of the deep bowl derived from the Mycenaean form FS-284 and the bell-shaped crater, but also the first appearance of round bottom tripod cooking pots. The crucial changes in the tableware repertoire, in line with mainland traditions, gave way to a new homogeneous cultural package within the Creton communities at the beginning of LM3C, an homogeneity that had disappeared since the collapse of the Knotian polity 100 years earlier. But here, the changing patterns that trigger some kind of uniformity in pottery traditions seems to relate to entirely different phenomena, presumably connected with the movement of people from the mainland to Crete in this troubled period. However, in parallel with this overall homogeneity, some localism can also be identified. In a recent assessment of the sudden introduction of round bottom tripod cooking pots at Sisi and elsewhere in central Crete at the end of LM3B, I have argued that the idea of this new cooking shape may have been brought to the island by groups of people who moved from the mainland to Crete and who didn't remain separated from the local population, but mingled. Indeed, these vessels do not seem to be the product of relocated potters trained on the mainland, since they show several morphological and, and technical traits linked to local Cretan traditions. A century-old fabric recipe, a wheel cold forming method, and the shaping of rolled handles fixed horizontally, all of which prompt us to recognize the work of local potters. Such hybridized vessels could therefore appear in our reflection today as a certain kind of cultural manifestation, neither local nor foreign, but one that results from the mobility and cohabitation of different communities on the island of Crete in lm 3 advance, including some elements from the Mycenaean mainland. In conclusion, the disappearance of the final palace at Knossos and of its dominant position at the end of lm 3 2 seems to have prompted the development of regional traditions in Crete, especially visible in ceramics, and for which Sisi produces relevant evidence. Indeed, this new sociopolitical situation saw the revival or growth of regional centers and traditions, as well as the mixing of new expressive styles in the material culture. It may well be that the disappearance of a main authority at Knossos also trigger a thorough reorganization of the exchange system of goods in Crete, which possibly boosted new alliances between important or growing sites, such as, for example, between the Sisi and Malia plains and the Pediada. The post palatial period, therefore, did not suffer any dramatic decrease of interregional interactions on and outside the island. The island. But this happened in a period that was certainly and repeatedly troubled, whether by the disappearance of a strong authority, earthquakes, 
the arrival of new groups, or other ex external elements that constantly shook the resilience of the lively Cretan communities, such as those at the vibrant side of Sisi. Thank you very much for your attention.